all right, 17 days until the voice referendum. Today in Canberra, of course, Yes Vote activist Noel Pearson addressed the National Press Club. And at Parliament House, Qantas fronted that Senate inquiry. The old boss, though, who was there when the decisions were made, Alan Joyce, well, he was a no-show. Joining me now for more, the Daily Telegraph's National Affairs Editor, Sky News host, of course, James Morrow, and senior Sky News Canberra reporter, one of the best, Trudy McIntosh. Welcome to you both. We saw, Trudy, there some vision of that Qantas aviation inquiry. Um, tough questioning on both sides. Bridget McKenzie, of course, uh, put some pressure on the CEO, Vanessa Hudson. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lawyer. We saw Richard Goiter, who, of course, as well as the Qantas chairmanship, is also the AFL chairman. How did they go? Hmm. Well, a big headwinds facing the national carrier, no doubt about it. I can see out of the corner of my eye, Peter, this inquiry is still going. She's been fronting senators now for over three hours, a long-haul experience for her, her first outing at the Senate inquiry as CEO, her first time she's been grilled since she took over from Alan Joyce. Look, the big takeaway here, Richard Goyd at the chair, despite that growing pressure from shareholders, from the pilots' union, from politicians, for him to stand aside, uh, he is not doing that. He says... He's spoken to major shareholders and they're telling him they want him to remain at the helm as chairman uh, to help this transition with a new CEO. Uh, another apology, we got that from the CEO today. The real proof, though, is in the pudding. Are they actually going to improve customer service? Are they going to fix some of these major issues? And they're still facing that pretty big court action when it comes to those ghost flights. And, James, I'll bring you in if I can, because Alan Joyce, I mentioned, you know, he was there when these decisions were made, not... Vanessa Hudson, she was the CFO, but she certainly wasn't the boss. According to his lawyers, his no-show was due to personal obligations. But isn't he on a holiday overseas? Well, yeah, he is, Peter, on a holiday overseas. At least that's my understanding of it. And I'll tell you something. I have been dipping in and out of these hearings all afternoon. And I'll tell you what, Peter, you know, Anthony Albanese thought the voice would bring the nation together. These hearings have brought the nation together. We had, uh, you know, Tony Sheldon from the Labor left. We've had Greens. We've had Simon Birmingham from the moderate right. We've had Bridget McKenzie all going and just absolutely delivering a beatdown on these guys. And for Alan Joyce to, you know, not be there. And then the the whole backing and forthing between the, the whole team there, not just Vanessa Hudson, but the, the chair, Richard Goiter, and the fellow from um, Corporate Affairs, Finch. It's been extraordinary to watch them handball these things back and forth and have to be nailed down on every single thing. You would think they would have come, Peter, with better answers than some of the glib responses and the, I don't know, we'll take that on notice that we've been seeing. Mm. Well, let's go to the comments today. Quite seismic comments from former Reserve Bank Governor Ian McFarlane saying that the proposed changes by Labor to the RBA will put the bank's future at a huge risk, that's his quote, and constitute an experiment in its operations. Trudy, should we be concerned? Well, this Reserve Bank review has been bubbling away for some time. 51 recommendations. Ian McFarlane, though, he was at the helm of the Reserve Bank as governor for a decade, starting in 1996. There's a lot of views as to what's the best way forward for our central bank. The Treasurer says he's accepted a lot of these in principle. They're still working through the detail. Uh, McFarlane's point, though, is about the number of part-timers that are part of the RBA board. A lot of technical detail that probably flies over the head of most Australians, but it is important that we get this right um, and for the Treasurer to be listening to those who have actually uh, been at the bank for a long time. James, we saw that footage there of Noel Pearson addressing the National Press Club today. He said uh, the referendum is Australia's last best hope for reconciliation. Meanwhile, a tweet today from fellow activist Professor Megan Davis it reads, the Uluru statement, she says, is one page. This will in time become the most ridiculous campaign lie. She said, it's embarrassing for the nation, James. Well, I reckon she's the only one with egg on her face, isn't she? Well, Peter, I mean, I can't believe we're still having an argument about this. You know, you and I have both reported on, covered this. I asked Megan Davis about this when her book was published about the history of the Uluru Statement, in which in the manuscript that went to the printer, it said... There was an 18-page document, so more than that with obviously the footnotes that you and I have both talked about. Um, no, it's ridiculous. It's real sort of Hail Mary play, play stuff um, from the Yes campaign here. And I thought Noel Pearson's speech today, 
I mean, on the one hand, he's talking about reconciliation, but then on the other hand, he talks about indigenous people, Aboriginal Australians, always being separate, always needing some other sort of form of representation. So I don't know how you ever re achieve reconciliation under those uh, under that logic.